about that false start. I ran off and get, no, had needed water. How many lost their power last night? Not many. Well, you did. We did too. Ours was off until went off about four o'clock and stayed off until whatever time it went up and back in the night. I was asleep when it came back on, so I don't know. Whew. It's a mess. It is a very bad mess. I was afraid I wasn't going to get to shower this morning. I didn't get to cut my hair. It looked awful, I know, but Bobby Cash said the only time I cut my hair is when I'm teaching. So he knows he's apparently been paying attention. So, but, um, I got a kind of a weird thing happened to me. I was planning on teaching something else. And uh, this morning, about 6 o'clock, the Lord said, no, we're going to go somewhere else. And I guess what I had in my mind was something that I wanted to do. And, and I guess now it's what he wants. So we're going to go with what he wants. And hopefully that'll be the, the right way. I mean, that's always the right way if it's what he really wants. So um, good to see you, Brother Ronnie. Would you pray for us this morning? Thank you, brother. Tell you what, it's hard when you miss, when you ain't here and you want to be here. I know exactly what that's like. And uh, we've missed you, brother. Good to have you back. Good to have you, sister. Y'all are, y'all been in our hearts. Um, I want to talk this morning. Turn to John 17 if you've got your Bibles, and I hope you do. This may be the shortest Sunday school class we've ever had. I'm not sure. Um, but we'll see what happens. We'll trust the Lord and let him have it. Well, I'm going to read 13 verses, but I want to just con- kind of settle in on one. But it's hard to figure out sometimes what to leave out. It's a lot harder to, to figure out what to leave out than it is to what to put in. There's so much in here on every subject you ever want to cover. It's harder to leave out something. So I'm going to back up and just read this whole thing. Now, what we're about to read, we hear a lot of people talking about the Lord's Prayer. Uh, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be. That's not the Lord's Prayer. This is. This is the Lord's Prayer. That is the disciples' prayer. Our Father, which art in heaven. He said, teach us to pray, Lord. And he said, pray ye after this manner. He didn't say he prayed like that. He told us to pray like that. So this is the Lord's Prayer, and I'll I tell you something, there's, some, there's so much good in this. Uh, so I'm just going to go ahead and start right here in, in verse 1. These words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour is come. Glorify thy Son, that thy Son also may glorify thee. As thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him, And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world. Thine they were, and thou gavest them me. And they have kept thy word. Well, that's a good thing to say. Now they have known that all things whatsoever thou hast given me are of thee, for I have given unto them the words which thou gavest me. And they have received them, and have known surely that I came out from thee, and they have believed that thou didst send me. I pray for them. I pray not for the world, but for them which thou hast given me, for they are thine. And all mine are thine, and thine are mine, and I am glorified in them. And now I am no more in the world, but these are in the world, and I come to thee. Holy Father, keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in thy name, 
Those that thou gavest me I have kept, and none of them is lost but the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. And now come I to thee, and these things I speak in the world, that they might have my joy fulfilled in themselves. Now I'll concentrate right there on 13. All, I read all those things because of what he just said. These, these things, I, well, where'd I go? And now I come to thee, and these things I speak in the world, that they might have my joy fulfilled in themselves. All of that led up to the fact that we ought to have joy. And, and what I want to talk about today is Christian joy. And sadly, it's a thing that's lacking in, the, in most of the Christian church today. Um, you don't see it as much as we ought to. And if you look, joy in all its forms is mentioned 475 times in the Bible. And sorrow about 125 times in all its forms. So joy is mentioned four times to one in, as opposed to sorrow. So we ought to be four times as joyful as we are sorrowful. I mean, that's, that's fairly good math to me. I, I'm not the smartest guy in the world, but that ain't, that ain't hard to figure out. And the truth of the matter is, we have, there are things that go on in life that cause sorrow. Okay? Uh, you know, we lose loved ones. He talked about that, that as you sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. So we, we understand that there is sorrow going on in the world, and we have to live with that, and we have to deal with that. But there should be joy. There should be more joy than, more, than sorrow in every, in every instance in our lives. Webster defines joy as this, excitement of pleasurable feeling caused by the acquisition or expectation of good. Now, who has acquired more good than we have? If you're born again, you have acquired the good. I mean, there's nothing better than Jesus Christ, right? So, who, who has more expectation of good than we do? We have the blessed hope, okay? So, as far as I'm concerned, there's nothing that should hinder us from being joyful. Not a thing. Look at, as far as us being able to expect joy, look at verse 20 right here in John 17. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word. That's you and me. That's us. Now, I said this before, but you, ever, you think Jesus ever prayed a prayer that didn't get answered? I mean, think about what he says and, and, and the way he says things. He prayed for us. He prayed that we would be one. The prayer that he said right here, uh, where is that? No, verse 11. And now I am no more in the world, but these are in the world, and I come to thee. So he's praying, these are in the world. He says, I can't, I'm not praying you take them out of the world. He said that in another verse. He said, but that you keep them from the evil. He said this, Holy Father, keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are. Well, that's, a, that's an answered prayer. You know, the body of Christ is one body, right? There's not two or three bodies of Christ running around out here. There's one. And Jesus Christ prayed that that would happen, that the, that the church would be one, and it is. But are we really one in unity? Uh, and, and that's what he would like. I mean, that, I know that that's what he would like. So, so where, where is the joy? Where... Uh, there's a church out in the halls had the greatest sign I ever read one time. It said, if you have Jesus Christ living in your heart, inform your face. I thought that was pretty good. I mean, in all seriousness, if you're walking around all, I hate everything. Everybody in here probably knows that one person that you can't hardly tolerate to be around them because they never have anything good to say. It's always, oh man, this place, I hate this thing, that thing's going on. Everybody knows that one person. And man, don't let that be us. We, this is the face I was given. I can't help this. I'm not mad at anybody and I look like I'm mad all the time. People think that I'm fighting mad constantly. But I'm not. I'm happy as I can be. I have, I have the joy of the Lord in me, and, and this is just the face I was given. So I can't help that. But 
uh, you know, we, we don't have to look like we're just ready to fight at all times. You know, we ought to, we ought to have some joy. But listen what, listen what Habakkuk said. He said in 3.17 and 18, he said, Although the fig tree shall not blossom, neither shall fruit be in the vines, the labor of the olive shall fail, and the field shall yield no meat, the flock shall be cut off from the fold, and there shall be no herd in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord, I will joy in the God of my salvation. Now let's bring that down to what we live, just for a second. I don't, I don't think the King James Bible needs to be retranslated in any way, shape, or form. Sometimes you might need to make it understood a little better. So let's bring it down to our world right here. Though I ain't got the money to buy the food I need this week, I got joy because I'm saved. I have, I have joy in the Lord because I have those things that I need. You know, the Lord never, ever let me go without the things I need. I mean, we get a lot of times, we get things we don't want. I mean, you know, we, we don't get the things we want. But a lot of times, we want more than we need. I mean, think about it. None of us have gone that hungry. I mean, it wouldn't hurt me to go a little hungry about two or three days a week. But we always have what we need. I mean, let's, let's put this down here in our, in our language again. Though Donald Trump be not president... Hey, that's not where our joy lies. See, our joy doesn't lie in the things of the world. Our joy doesn't lie in who's running the country, or it shouldn't. Let's put it that way, it shouldn't. Our, our, our joy shouldn't lie in the things that we possess. See, those are happiness. See, the word happiness comes, it's, it's derived from, from hap, you know, from the things that happen. And, and our happiness can be temporary, and man, sure is. I mean, you look around. If, if you look around at what's going on, your happiness will surely be temporary. I mean, because there ain't that much to be happy about what's going on in this world right now. I mean, you think about what happened last week in Nashville. There's some sad folks out there. There's some people that are really experiencing real sorrow going on out there. And, and sometimes that happens to us. But does it change the fact that you're born again? Does it change the fact that you have a home in heaven? It doesn't change the fact that Jesus Christ himself will come for you one day if you're born again. See, we have the, the, the joy of all joys, you know. And, I, I mean, I could, I could cut this off right there just about say, you know, the secret of true joy is Jesus Christ. But we have, we have other hindrances to joy. You know, a lot of times uh, the, the biggest main hindrance to having joy in your life is not being saved. I mean, if you're not saved, you can be happy, but you can't have joy. There's a, there's a completely different thing there. Uh, and, and I, you know, I'd advise you to be born again. <laughs> it's, a, it's an easy thing to do. Just come right down here and the Lord will accept you. And, and that'll be, that'll be that. Somebody can show you how to go through the Bible and find how to be saved. We'll show you that. And you can get born again here today. See, that's the thing. It's now is the accepted time. So anybody can be born again. There, there's nobody who's done too much. There's nobody who's gone too far. There's nobody who's, who's you know, done a bigger sin than, than could be forgiven. So we, we shouldn't let being lost be a hindrance to our joy. We can get born again. Now, I don't like acronyms too much, but there's one in here that's pretty good. A lot of times we have our joy uh, robbed from us because we got the order wrong. You know, they say joy means Jesus first, others next, yourself last. Uh, that's a pretty good acronym. I, like I said, I don't usually like acronyms, but that's a pretty good one. Uh, and if you've got the order correct, you can have true joy because Jesus Christ will not settle for second place. He'll never take last place, and not, not that you have any joy. Okay, we're talking about joy. So he'll never take last place. He'll never take second place. If he's first place, that's a real good start to you having the joy of the Lord in your life the way you want to have it. And when we put others before ourselves, we're obedient to the Word. 
See, that's, this book tells us that's what we ought to be doing. We should never put ourselves ahead of you. I should never be ahead of anybody here. I ought to put everybody here ahead of me. And everybody here ought to put everybody here ahead of them. It's kind of, you know, it's a reciprocal thing that, that ought to work. And it does work. So another, another hindrance to our joy is walking in the faith, or walking in the flesh. Walking in the faith doesn't hinder joy, brother. <laughs> but walking in the flesh will hinder your joy. Because when you walk in the flesh, let's, well, let's go to Galatians 5. I've got so many markers up here. We'll have to dig and find out. Here we are. Sixteen. This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary, the one to the other, so you cannot do the things that you would. But if you be led of the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are these, are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like. Of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. You cannot walk in the joy of the Lord living in the flesh. Now, that's a big ugly list. If you think about it, those works of the flesh, we attribute most of that to the devil. But those are works of the flesh. And if we yield to the flesh and yield to the flesh constantly, that's how we're going to be living. That's how we're going to be, and, and there's going to be no joy. <coughs> it's impossible to have the joy of the Lord walking in the flesh. It's utterly impossible to be close to the Lord and live that way. And the only way we're going to have the joy of the Lord is to be close to Him. So our lives directly affect how we have joy or not joy and the way that we live. I'll tell you something else. Look at First Peter. Uh, sometimes in these trials that we face daily, we forget or, or maybe don't understand the power of God. And I'm trying to mark this thing so I can close that. There we go. Look at chapter 1, 1 Peter. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to His abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time, wherein you greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, you are in heaviness through manifold temptations, that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ." Whom having not seen, ye love. In whom, though now ye see him not, yet believing, ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. How often have you seen that? How often do we see that joy unspeakable and full of glory? You know, the problem is, he's talking about these manifold temptations and all the trials and tribulations and troubles that we face every day eating us up. And not realizing that if you're born again, we should have the joy of the Lord. So what he look what look what he said. He said to an inheritance. He said, "Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to His abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead." We're about to we're about to celebrate Resurrection Sunday next week. And, and as that approaches, the day comes, we ought to think more and more and more about the truth of the fact that we're going to be resurrected just like Him. I mean, Jesus Christ is alive from the dead. And one day, if these bodies die, we'll be resurrected just like He was. 
just like that. And even better than that, because it's going to be, like I said a while ago, it's going to be him that comes. You know, John 14 blows my mind. That's actually my favorite Bible verses in the, in the world. John 14, like 1 through 3 and 4 there, he's coming for us. He said, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. So it's true, right? He said it was true. He said, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go, I will come again to receive you unto myself that where I am there you may be also. He's not, gonna, he's not sending Peter, James, and John. He's not entrusting the angels to this thing. This is his thing. This is what he wants. This is his desire is to fellowship with us and be with us, right? So when he comes for us, he's coming himself. I don't ever have to worry about that fact. We should absolutely be joyful over the fact that we know one day he's coming for us, that it's him. You'll hear his voice. You'll see his face one day. There's joy in that. There should, there should be some more, way more excitement in that than there is. We're just not, somehow it, it seems that we just don't understand that fact. If we really understood all that that entailed, we'd, we'd have a lot more joy than we do. A lot more. So what is the, the secret of true joy? It's not really a secret. It's Jesus Christ. See, Jesus Christ is the secret of true joy. So how do we get it? How do we have that true joy? What does it take to, to put aside these worldly things and, and, and the things that hinder us so bad from having that true joy? Well, let's find out. Be easy. Look at Acts chapter 8. And I've actually got it marked. I thought I did. I marked chapter 9. It was dark last night when I was studying this because I had no electricity. Look what happened here. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. And the people with one accord gave heed unto those things which Philip spake, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. For unclean spirits, crying with loud voice, came out of many that were possessed with them, and many taken with palsies, and that were lame were healed. And there was great joy in that city. So what is it? First of all, we need to start listening to the preaching. I mean, there's, he went there and preached Jesus Christ. And people were being healed because of the power of Jesus Christ, not because of what he was doing, but they saw something there. They saw something in the preaching. They saw something in the power that was being preached that made them joyful. Listen, there's power here. There's power in this church house. When we come together, the power of God comes into this place the, the way we would like to see it. it. doesn't always happen that way. But there's always power in here. We can come together and see the power of God move in our midst if we're looking for it. That's the thing. We need, to, we need to come together and start looking. Look at Acts 13. Now this one here, there's trouble. There's some trouble going on here in Acts 13. Where am I at? Let's back up here. Let's see, 44. And the next Sabbath day came almost the whole city together to hear the word of God. That's a good thing. But when the Jews saw the multitudes, they were filled with envy and spake against those things which were spoken by Paul, contradicting and blaspheming. Then Paul and Barnabas waxed bold and said it was necessary that the word of God should first have been spoken to you, but seeing you put it from you and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, lo, we turn to the Gentiles. For so hath the word of the Lord commanded us, saying, I have set thee to be a light to the Gentiles, that thou, may, that thou shouldest be for salvation unto the ends of the earth. 
And when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and glorified the word of the Lord. And as many as were ordained to eternal life believed. And the word of the Lord was published throughout the region, throughout all the region. But the Jews stirred up the devout and honorable women and the chief men of the city and raised persecution against Paul and Barnabas and expelled them out of their coast. That don't look good, right? Pretty bad right now. They persecuted them, grabbed them up and threw them out of the city, took them out and, and kicked them out. They, they were blaspheming. They turned, to, turned people against them. But they shook off the dust of their feet against them and came unto Iconium, and the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Ghost. They were filled with joy because Jesus Christ was preached. They knew that the preaching was done right. It was done the way it was supposed to be done. And they were filled with joy. Didn't matter what the circumstances were. Is there turmoil in the church today? Absolutely. Listen, not everybody that's going to be in this service today when the preaching starts is here because they absolutely desire to be here. Simple as that. Not everybody that's going to sit in this church today is happy that they're here. So what happens, you got spirits that come in, and you got these things conflicting with one another. And if everybody here were in one mind and one accord, you'd see the power of God move in this place like you've never seen it before. It can happen. Listen, the Bible's true, no matter what anybody thinks or says. The Bible's accurate and true. And if we obeyed it, we could see God move like he's never moved in this place before ever. But the truth of the matter is, not everybody in this building has come together for the same reason. Some are here because, well, it's Sunday, and that's just the thing we do. We go to church on Sunday. And that's not, I mean, that's not the worst thing in the world. Thank God they're here. They're getting to be preached to. Some are mad because they had to come. Now, I doubt that's happening right here in Sunday school, okay? Because you got up and you made it here on purpose, you know. But there's, a, there's another service coming after this that people are going to be dragged in here, uh, some of them. You know, and, and I mean, you can see it. Uh, you, you guys that teach Sunday school and preach in here, you, you know what I'm talking about up here. You can see what's going on out in the crowd. You know the folks that really, oh, I always teach, shut up, I'm sick of him. You know, you can hear that. I mean, and I understand that. When I'm up here, it's okay, I got it. I, I, I get it. I don't want to hear me either. But the truth of the matter is, the spirits conflict with one another. And these things cause problems. And in spite of that, though, see, in spite of the problems that are here, in spite of the conflicting spirits that are in this place, if you got your heart right, you can have joy in here this morning. You can affect the service that we're going to have this morning. Your attitude and your, your joy can be contagious. Those of you who've been here for a long time, you remember when we used to have them barn burner services here that would start in the choir and you could, I mean, man, you could hear it. You, you could see it start. They'd be three or four, get a little bit happy, and then three or four more. And then before, before you know it, the whole choir is just having a blast up here. And you can watch it wash over the crowd like a wave. Now, that can happen again. We can see those things take place if we want them to take place. They can and they will if we let them. But the thing of the word, you know what I've noticed in both these passages right here in Acts? The word of the Lord was published. See? The word of God. If we take our joy in the word of God and the spirit of God and the Lord Jesus Christ and the power of God, you know what he said? Set your affection on things above, not on things in the earth. So if we've got our affection, the things that we love, that's what it is, right? Our affection is the things that we love. So if we set our affection on those heavenly things, like the Word of God, and, and preaching is a heavenly thing, by the way. It's not something the world understands. God chose by the foolishness of preaching to save them that would believe, right? So preaching, that's a good thing. That's a heavenly thing. When the Word of God is published, there it is. I mean, it, it, it should take off like wildfire in this church, and it can but here's the problem. We all find it a way to hold back. You know, nobody wants to be the first one to shout. And that's a sad thing. I mean, that's really sad. 
and I, you all have heard me say this a thousand times, but I was the devil's fool for a long time. It sure wouldn't hurt me to look like a fool for the Lord, would it? So I ought to be able to just jump right straight up and down and holler and shout and carry on like something crazy. But sometimes I hold that back, just like everybody else does. And I tell you what, I'll make a deal with all of you today. I won't hold back nothing if you won't. And this, this crowd right here is about half what we're going to have, but we could affect the service today. We could. We could really affect this service if we'd allow the joy of the Lord to bubble up and, and, and overflow every now and then. Old Dean McNeese was talking about popping them happy bubbles. Uh, you know, happy is okay, but boy, joy is even better than that. Amen. So let's allow the Lord to have his way this morning would be good. Listen to Romans 5.10. He says, For if when we were enemies we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. See, we're not waiting to be saved. And that ought to have, that ought to have a, a real consequence in our lives. The fact that we are not waiting to be saved. We're saved. If, we're, if we've accepted Jesus Christ, we are saved. I am not waiting for eternal life. I'm living it right now. We have re now received the atonement. The debt's been paid. It's, it's been put on our account. We're saved. We're living eternal life right now. Jesus said, He that liveth and believeth in me shall never die. That's perfect. What can you get better than that? What could cause more joy than that? Nothing I know of. Now listen to what he said in Romans again, 14, 17. For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink. So we're part of that kingdom, right? The kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness. Is that yours or his? His. Thank you, brother. The righteousness of Jesus Christ. He said, but righteousness and peace. That's the peace of God. Let the peace of God rule in your hearts, he said. That's the peace of Jesus Christ and joy in the Holy Ghost. If the Holy Ghost lives inside you, and he does if you're born again, if the Holy Ghost lives inside you, he is trying his best to incite joy in you. That's what he wants. That's exactly what he's after. And, he, and you can have it. You can have it. There's joy like Peter said, joy unspeakable and full of glory. I understand there's times you get so happy. You, uh, me, I, I'll be honest with you, me, I'm still a big fat baby. When the Lord saved me, he squeezed my heart till the juice ran out my eyes. And it's, I've been that way ever since. I've never got over it. And I pray to God I never do. As long as he can get a hold of my tender heart. See, that's what I like. I can sit back there where I sit and, and get so full of joy, I just sit there and cry like a little fat baby. And I don't care. I don't care who sees it. I don't care who knows it. I'm happy about that fact that he has given me something that I can, I can look to and say, look here, what the Lord did for me. I know he did that for me because I, I never had that at all. If you didn't know me before I got saved, you wouldn't have thought I'd ever sat and cried about nothing. I mean, seriously, I, I, had, I had a cold, hard heart. And there's joy in it now because of what the Lord did for me. He's, here's what Paul prayed. Now the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing. See, so that's the thing. We let doubt creep in sometimes, don't we? I mean, sometimes we just sit and we honestly doubt the things of God. Even though we're saved, even though we know we're saved, even though we know that, that God can do all things, we know there's nothing too hard for Him. The Bible says, is there anything too hard for God? No, there's not. But you know what happens? We let that doubt creep in and we let it rob us of our joy. He said, now, he said, now the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope. Abound in hope. Abound. That's not just have a little bit. That's overabundance of hope. That's, that's more hope than anybody else has ever had. Abound in hope. How? 
through the power of the Holy Ghost. See, we, we trust in ourselves way too much. And if we're going to ever have joy, if we're ever going to have the peace of God ruling in our hearts, we're going to have to trust Him to have it done. We have to lean on Him to have it done. We can't do this of ourselves. We, Jesus Christ said, apart from me, ye can do nothing. Well, He meant that. I don't think He had any trouble saying what He meant and meaning what He said when He said that. We have nothing that we're capable of apart from Him. Nothing spiritual. So that's what he's talking about. You can do all kinds of fleshly things. I mean, you can turn and walk away and, and, and lay your Bible down and never pick it back up, and that's fleshly. You can do all these things. You can, you can cuss and swear and, and drink and stomp and carry on and do all those things. That's all fleshly. But if you're going to have anything spiritual happen, if there's going to be anything, any joy or any peace or any hope, it's going to come from the Holy Ghost. And we're going to have to lean on Him for that. And if we just learn that, you know, learn up front. Lord, I know I'm useless. You're going to have to help me. I mean, that's the way it's going to come. That's the only way it's going to come. Now, 2 Corinthians 8, 1. Moreover, brethren, we do you to wit of the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia, how then in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty. Now, think about that a minute. Do those two things sound like they go together at all? Just think about that. The abundance of their joy and their deep poverty. What? That don't make good sense. Do you know why? Their deep poverty abounded unto the riches of their liberality. For to their power I bear record, yea, and beyond their power they were willing of themselves. There's the thing. Right there's where the rubber meets the road. Beyond their power. See, they put everything they had into it and then trusted God. And God made a way. They're poor. They're having, pro they're having problems everywhere. But man, did they ever give. There's joy in giving. And I, I'm not standing up here talking about money all the time either. There's joy in giving your time. There's joy in giving your heart. There's joy in this thing. We can give of ourselves and have joy for that. Do you ever, you ever actually find yourself helping somebody? <laughs> I mean, really helping somebody that needed help, somebody that was really down and, and you knew it and you were able to help. Do you know how, remember how that felt? There's joy in that, in knowing that you were able to do something good for somebody else. That ought to be, think about that. Now, I, like I said, I'm not talking about money all the time. It, yeah, it helps sometimes to give somebody some money. I mean, you know people who are broke, but you can't always hand money out because sometimes the money is going to make the problem worse. I mean, that's just simple truth. You got a drug addict standing out here holding his hand out, you ain't going to help him giving him money. But you can help him because you've got something to give him. If you know anything about Jesus Christ, you've got something you can give him. And you can help him. So, there's also joy in fellowship. I'm getting real close to winding down here, but there's joy in fellowship. And I experienced that joy last Sunday. Uh, and I usually do all the time. Honestly, everybody that knows me, you know I'm, I'm, I like to talk to people. I enjoy people. Uh, more, than, more than just about anything, I enjoy people. And especially brothers and sisters in the Lord. We, can, we got something in common. We're family. We can talk. Uh, but last Sunday, uh, I preached at another church, uh, had both services and Sunday school. And after Sunday night service, I, I kind of figured they were pretty well sick and tired of me, you know, ready to go home. But nobody left. I mean, I was long-winded Sunday night, preached a little longer than I should have, and nobody left. We all hung out. We all had a good time. I bet we were there 45 minutes after the service was over, and not one person left. The whole bunch stayed there, and we all had fellowship after the service, and it was good. There's joy in that. I went home feeling real good about that whole thing. I mean, it was, it was really a good time in the Lord, and, and we can do that. See, here's the thing. A lot of us come in here on Sunday and never see anybody else the rest of the week. We don't know anybody outside this building on Sunday. 
after the week or after Sunday, I should try to. I'll, I'll get my words out in a minute. I knew what I meant. <laughs> That's what I tell my wife all the time. I knew what I meant. But seriously, we, we ought to be able to fellowship with, with one another outside these walls. Amen. We really should. We, we ought to care about one another enough to fellowship outside these walls. Look what he says. He said in John, uh, 1 John 1, 1, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard and which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled of the word of life. For the life was manifested and we have seen it and bear witness and show unto you that eternal life, which was with the Father and was manifested to us. That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you that ye also may have fellowship with us and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. And these things write we unto you that your joy may be full. There is such joy in fellowship with the Lord. I mean, I'll tell you something. There, there are times when you really, really, really need something from God. And you'll get down and you pray and spend time on your face. But the times when you don't need anything... The times when, when you're not there to ask for something, you're not there to, to, to plead somebody else's cause, but the times when you're there just to fellowship. Lord, I just want to hear from you. Sit down and you spend time in prayer and you read your Bible. You'll hear from him. You'll hear from him. Listen, I'll never stop saying this. You all have heard me say this a hundred times probably, but God wants to fellowship with you way more than you want to fellowship with him. If we could get that reversed, get that spun around, and, and, and really want to fellowship more with him than we do, man, we'd see so much things. So many things would change in our lives. So many things. But the truth of the matter is, that fellowship can be so sweet. I mean, it can be so good that you come away from that changed. Changed. And you can have that joy that we talk about so much when you come out of that. I mean, you come out of your closet, you know, like the preacher says, get in your closet. And you could come out of your closet so full of joy. I don't know how many times I've had that happen to me, come out of there. And, and the problem is with me, and I'm not, I'm not pointing fingers at anybody, I'm pointing them at me. Uh, that doesn't happen as often as it should. No. That I come out of there with that joy. That I go in there with no need other than the need to fellowship. And that, I'll tell you something, there's something great in that. There's something great in that. And the last thing I want to hit real quick here is this. In Hebrews 12, Hebrews 12, 1. How do you come across that joy? How do we maintain our joy? Is right there in the verse. It's easy. It doesn't sound easy, but it's easy. It is easy. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight. That's not the sin now. That's the weight. That's the things that drag you down. The things that trouble us, the things that worry us, that those weights that, that can easily drag you down. Lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Listen, I can't run your race. You can't run my race. And, and I, I know everybody in here has probably heard that analogy, but if you've got a track out here and, and been up and watched them do any kind of track and field, you've got a line that you stay in. If you're running around that track, you stay in your lane. And the, longer, the better you stay in your lane, the easier the race is to run. If you're wobbling around all over everybody else's lane, running into everybody else, you're not going to have a very good race. See, I can't, I can't go to Haiti and do Tom's job. Tom can't get in that big truck I drive and do mine at night. He'd be asleep in five minutes. <laughs> Quit laughing, Kathy. But seriously, run your race. God's got you something to do. I don't know what it is, and I can't be the one to tell you that. That's God's business, not mine. He'll tell you what, you, what he wants you to do, but he's got something for everybody in here. And pew holder down there ain't one of them. 
I mean, seriously, God never called anybody to sit down in here and hold these pews down. They do not fly around the room when we're not in here. Amen. So run your race. But how do you do that? Verse 2 is perfect. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. You get your eyes on him. See? You sit your eyes on him and you're not seeing all this other stuff. You know, y'all know Peter walked on the water. And he did. Now you imagine that? I know Jesus walked on the water, but Peter walked on water. Simon Peter. The loud mouth of the bunch. Walked on water. And what happened? When did he fall? When he got his eyes off the Lord. See? When he's looking at Jesus, looking unto Jesus, that's when he walked on the water. But the minute he started seeing the things around him, oh man, this is, uh oh, look at this. <laughs> he started sinking. Then he cried out immediately. And what happened? The Lord picked him right up, took him back to the ship. But do you know what happened? Nobody ever thinks about this. He walked on the water again to go back to the ship. Either that or the Lord picked him up and carried him or the other. I, I got it in my mind that the Lord pulled him up and they walked together back to the ship. That's the way I see that. Now, I ain't got no proof for that, but you get your version, I'll get mine. <laughs> but the truth of the matter is, if we're looking at him, there's no way to fall. No way to fall. If we got our, we got our heart set on him, our mind set on him, and our eyes set on him, there ain't no way to fall. There's no way to walk that life and not have joy. It's impossible. But you know what I get out of this right here? He said this, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Do you know what the joy set before him is? It's us. That's the joy that's set before him is us. He endured the cross I've heard, I heard a preacher one time say that he enjoyed the cross. I said, that ain't what that says. That says he endured it. It wasn't a joy. The joy that was set before him was us, not the cross. He endured the cross and despised the shame of that cross. But he did it for us. Because that joy that he's going to receive when he takes us unto himself. Think about that. That joy that we're going to cause him... Man, that's some kind of thought. Are we causing him any joy right now? I mean, he should be causing us plenty. But what about us? Are we causing him any? He said, for consider him, and I'm done with this verse, consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. You consider what all he did and how he did that. The Bible says he set his face like a flint. He had his mind made up. You know what he said one time there? He said, he said, the hour has come, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour, but for this cause came I unto this hour. He never faded. He headed for the cross, and he went straight at it, and he never stopped. He never slowed down. That we ought to consider. We ought to consider what it took him the faith that he had and the strength that he had and the power that he had to do what he had to do for us. You know what the Bible says about David? When, when, when everything was coming against him and the people were talking about stoning David, the Bible says, but David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. That's what he's talking about right here. Encourage ourselves in the Lord our God. That's Jesus Christ. And that's the secret of true joy. And that's all there is to that. I'm done. Father, we thank you, Lord. Thank you that we can have joy. Thank you, Father, for the day that you've given us today and the service we're about to enter into, Lord. I ask you that you'd have your will and your way. Help us, Father, today to yield to you and allow you to produce that joy in our hearts that we need so bad. And we'll thank you for it. And we love you. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Remember our deal.